Hello everyone, welcome to Radiology Case Review Series. In this video, we are going to look at a 50-something year old female who presented to emergency department following MVC. Following trauma, she was unable to move all her extremities. As part of trauma series workup, she initially underwent CT cervical spine examination. On the sagittal cervical spine images, there was no evidence of acute fracture or traumatic lysthesis. As you can see, patient has extensive ossification of posterior longitudinal ligament, most prominent at C2, C3 level and at C5, C6 level, causing severe narrowing of the spinal canal. On the axial images, again, we can identify marked ossification of posterior longitudinal ligament, which is narrowing the spinal canal at multiple levels. Given patient's clinical symptoms of inability to move her extremities, patient underwent MRI cervical spine examination to evaluate for any potential spinal cord injury. On the sagittal stir images, we can see mild prevertebral edema. There is also mild edema in the interspinous ligaments. We can again see ossification of posterior longitudinal ligament, which is causing severe narrowing of the spinal canal. We can also identify spinal cord edema at C5, C6 level. Similar findings are also identified on the sagittal T2 images, marked ossification of posterior longitudinal ligament causing severe narrowing of the spinal canal. On the axial T2 images, we can see ossified posterior longitudinal ligament causing severe narrowing of the spinal canal with flattening of the spinal cord. At multiple levels, we can also identify the high signal within the spinal cord. Our patient underwent emergency posterior spinal decompression and fusion extending from suboccipital region to upper thoracic spine, we can see the fusion hardware. Our patient had ossification of posterior longitudinal ligament. I think minor trauma led to spinal cord contusion in the setting of ossified posterior longitudinal ligament causing severe spinal canal stenosis. I found this article in the literature where they looked at the ossification of posterior longitudinal ligament evaluation with MRI. They classified the OPLL into four categories. Type 1 was contiguous ossification, type 2 is segmental ossification, type 3 is mixed type and type 4 is focal ossification. On the axial images, they were classifying the OPLL into square shaped, mushroom shaped and triangular or mountain shaped. In this article, they were looking at clinical and imaging predictors for surgical outcome in patients with OPLL. They looked at various parameters on the radiographs. They were looking for alignment of the cervical spine, if it was lordotic or kyphotic. They again classified the ossification into four categories, as we saw in the previous article. On the axial images, they were classifying if it was broad-based or narrow-based. They also looked at how much of OPLL was occupying the spinal canal, i.e. occupying ratio. They also looked if the OPLL was anterior or posterior to the K line, which was drawn by connecting the midpoints of the spinal canal at C to C7 levels. They also assessed the cross sectional area of the spinal cord and assessed for the signal changes in the spinal cord and on T1 and T2 images if it was hyperintense on T2 and hypointense on T1. They also assessed for the dural ossification, i.e., double layer sign. Based on their evaluation, they found that patients had poor outcome with kyphotic cervical spine alignment, small transverse diameter of the spinal cord, or if there are intramedullary signal abnormalities. They also found that patients who had longer duration of symptoms and T1 hypointensity had adverse outcome. They concluded that patients with longer duration of symptoms, T1 hypointensity, or history of minor trauma had poor outcome. They also noticed that smaller transfer diameter of the spinal cord and T2 hyperintensity also predict a poor outcome. I hope you found this case to be informative. Thanks for your attention.